Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Government is shut down, and so is the Capitol. And a third budget plan will be proposed. Those issues in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Barkey. It's been more than a week now since Minnesota's government shut down. The negotiations continue between the governor and GOP leaders. The sticky point continues to be the governor's inclination for $1.4 billion in new revenue and the Republicans' opposition to an increase of this amount. That issue is what continues to halt any major progress. The uh, governor uh, included a new offer today. Um, is very disappointing and a step backwards. Um, again, we're back at income taxes. Um, we now have, as another offer, uh, increase by a dollar a pack on cigarettes. Uh, we've made it very clear that we do not believe we need a tax increase to balance our budget. Probably the most disappointing part of it was that there was no details on where the money would be spent. What we have maintained all along whether it be January 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, when we started putting together budget targets, when the budget forecast came out in February, when we got to the new part where we were ready for negotiations during conference committees, it has always been about the spending. Adding additional tax increases at this point is pretty clear to us that things went backwards today. It's very disappointing. Five days in, the only solution we got from the governor was another tax increase followed by a second tax increase. The sales tax, the cigarette tax increase is probably one of the more regressive sales taxes. Um, again, uh, something that we don't agree with. Uh, but again, the most disappointing part is that we do still do not know where the governor would make budget reductions and where the governor would make those prioritized spending. Well, I, I didn't know that they were dead set against the, the tobacco tax. I mean, that, I, I was not aware of that. And trying to find an alternative source of revenue. The only source of revenue they've offered is to in, uh, increase the indebtedness of the state to borrow from the tobacco tax uh, settlement and use that revenue uh, to pay you know bonds over 20 years of, plus a considerable rate of interest. So, you know, I pointed out to them that my proposal raises the same amount in revenue, about 700 million, as theirs does. It's just mine comes from actually. Uh, secure sources of revenue, ongoing sources of revenue, not one time and not increasing the indebtedness. I've heard the, the line used by some of them, you know, we don't want to increase the, the debt we're putting on our children. Their proposal puts the increased debt on, on our children. They're the ones who add uh, 400 or 700 million dollars of, of in, in state indebtedness. Uh, and my proposal raises revenue. So, you know, if they don't agree with this one, then it's incumbent on them to come back with a, another proposal and we'll keep this process going. Senate Majority Leader Amy Koch is here now to talk a little bit more about those budget negotiations. Thank you so much for joining us well, today. thank you for having me. Let's begin with the big picture. Governor Dayton characterizes a $34 billion budget as not reflective of Minnesota's values. Your caucus, of course, disagrees. How do you see a $34 billion budget? And, and its priorities panning out. Sure. Well, I mean, the budget that we passed, the $34 billion budget, is the largest budget in state's history. Uh, and so I completely disagree with the governor, obviously. I think it is absolutely reflective of our values. Uh, in that, within that budget, we prioritized. Uh, we gave, there's an additional almost $450 million to K-12 education. There's an additional $600 million in health and human services. And that is over and above the, pa the, last, uh, the last biennium. So the last budget cycle around, there's, a, all, there's almost a billion dollars in additional money to those areas. Uh, but that required some trade-offs, and Minnesotans understand that. Uh, and so there are some reductions, but we tried to mitigate those reductions with some reforms. And so if we had to put some more money into K-12, then we said, well, we're not going to just put more money in and spend it the same way. We're going to look at ways to close the achievement gap, which is incredibly important to Minnesotans, and we're going to look for ways to spend that money better. That's what Minnesotans asked us to do. That's what Minnesotans have been doing in their very own budgets. You look across the state, and most families are living this, this budget, depending on if you count in the one-time money, if you count in the one-time federal money, it's a 6% increase. If you count in the one-time federal money and the shift, it's it's even. We've held spending flat. Uh, most Minnesota families and businesses have had their, their earnings stay flat if they're lucky. 
many of them have seen them go down. And so to ask state government to do the same, just to say, hey, you've got a 6% increase, or at the very worst, you're, you're spending flat, uh, I don't think that's unreasonable to ask. Uh, and, and have costs gone up in certain areas? Yes. But so gas is up for people, uh, grocery costs are up for families, and yet they're trying to figure out how to prioritize, how to change how they spend their money. Uh, and that is exactly what we're doing within this budget. So I think it is completely reflective of Minnesota values. So let's talk a little bit about the budget negotiations. In an offer made on Wednesday, both you and Speaker Zellers characterized it as disappointing. Was there anything inside that package that could maybe lead to a final resolution? You know, I think there are bits of it, and there are parts of it that we have proposed back, and so uh, we're going to keep working on that. But, you know, i tell you what, is a, it's a little disappointing, Julie, at this point for me. Uh, we are the only state that has now gone into government shutdown. Forty-nine out of 50 other governors have figured out how to get a budget deal done. And these are governors that are faced with mixed legislatures. In New York, uh, Governor Cuomo closed a $10 billion budget with a Republican Senate. In North Carolina, it's a Democrat governor, and it's a Republican House and Senate, and their budget is done. So I think it is time to ask the CEO, the governor of our state, to step up and lead. He needs to show us a path. He needs to give us his plan. We are in shutdown now. It is unacceptable. It is unnecessary. We have a budget that is, as I said, holding is a 6% increase in spending, uh, and it no, doesn't increase taxes, and it has the votes to pass. The governor can sign that bill, or he needs to have a plan of something that we can pass. I want to touch upon something that you just talked about, some of the other states that, that found a way to mm -hmm. resolve their budget issues. What are some of the factors you think are unique in Minnesota that have led us to this point, to a well, shutdown? You know, I don't, I don't know that we're unique. I think that Minnesota is facing the same issues that every other state is facing. Uh, we're facing a competitiveness from... Uh, other countries. We're facing competitiveness from other states. We're facing deficits, which most other states have uh, faced. We've got mixed legislature and a, we, and a Democrat, we've got Democrat governor and a, and a legislature that is Republican. That's not unusual in other states. So I guess the argument that I'm making is we're not any different and there's no need to be in shutdown. And uh, I think folks just have to ask, you know, what is the plan? You know, Governor Dayton, what is your plan? for taking us out of this. We were the one state that had state parks closed for the 4th of July. It was not necessary. A deal could have been had. Uh, at, uh, the bill, a deal in that bill could have been passed. A lights on bill could have been passed. There are many options to the shutdown. Uh, and, and yet, we, what we need is the governor to step up and lead. And we are where we are now, in shutdown mode, as you have said. So let's go back, going back to the when, offer on Wednesday. Are you supportive of, for example, the health care surcharges or your original right. offer had a school shift? Would you make that amount higher if necessary? No, uh, the governor actually, his, um, he, we had offered a very small shift, and then the governor kind of came in with this 50-50 idea. We scaled that back in another offer, so we've gone back and forth on that. There's concerns with that, and so we're, we're very careful of that. It's one-time money. It's not anything that we would prefer to do. I expect that it's not something that the governor prefers to do, uh, but it may or may not be part of a final package. Um, I, think, I think the biggest key that I'm looking for is the governor has offered, uh, his offer still includes $1.4 billion in additional spending. $1.4 billion on top of the largest general fund budget in the state's history. And so that's just not realistic. That's not reflective of Minnesota values. And we need to see something happen with that number. We did not offer, we, we offered some additional revenue to the governor, but $1.4 billion is not going to fly. Okay, now you personally felt it was important for your caucus members to be out in the community over the 4th of July weekend. We were talking a bit about that and talk with their constituents. So what did you hear from your constituents and did you find it challenging at all to, to be meeting with them and discussing well, this with and them? And I'd like to spend a lot more time at home. I'm finding that with my new position, uh, that's not happening nearly as much as I would like. Um, but no, I, you know, I find what, what my caucus found uh, is uh, you know, largely positive. Uh, people are frustrated. And I tell you, my members are frustrated. They want to have this solved. They would, they would come back and do a lights on bill. They'd like to come back and pass individual bills. Uh, they would like to get a deal done. And, and, and that is reflected in the offers that we've made to the governor. Um, but, uh, but overall, they heard from a lot of folks that are still, they get it. They're concerned about the spending. 
uh, and they were saying, you know, hang tough. We want you. We want you to get the best deal possible for us. We're not interested in out of control state spending. We can't afford it any longer, and so we want you. You know, we understand what you're doing, and we support you. And the DFL contends it's hearing basically the same message. So, at what point? Do those messages maybe be not necessarily pushed aside, but minimized a bit to try to get a deal done? Well, and that's and that's what you saw. I mean, the Thursday night, uh, you saw a big move on the part of the Republican caucuses. Um, in fact, I think for a lot of folks, it was a surprisingly big move. Uh, and yet, the governor walked away from the table. So now, uh, that's that's difficult. Uh, that's difficult, and that's why that's why I continue to say the governor needs to look at what was offered. He needs to understand what we've been saying for six months. No surprise. He needs to look at the budget we've passed and the priorities that we reflect in that uh, and then he needs to he needs to give he needs to come up with a plan uh, you know something that we can all not necessarily be happy with but something that we can agree on and madam leader let's talk real quickly about an independent commission appointed at the beginning oh, of yeah. the week by former governor Carlson vice president Mondale they're expected to release a third budget plan how open are you and your caucus to considering portions if not all of what comes out of that plan sure well if tax increases come out of that plan that's that's not going to happen. Uh, but I am happy to listen to anyone with any ideas. And obviously, uh, you know, there's some uh, some very you know, esteemed and knowledgeable people on that commission. So you know, we'll see what their ideas, what ideas they come up with. Um, as I would listen to any Minnesotan. And so, um, they, but ultimately, at the negotiation table, needs to be the governor, uh, the speaker of the house, and myself. And uh, and then we have the we have the job of getting the votes uh, that will pass uh, whatever budget we come up with. But you know, happy. To have, happy to have their suggestions. All right, so Madam Leader, my last question for you is, as you mentioned earlier, some Minnesotans are very frustrated with what's going on, so here's your chance to talk to your constituents statewide. What do you want them to know right now? Well, I want them to know, uh, I think the most important thing is that none of this none of this is necessary, that we're ready, we're here, we've been here for six months working. Uh, I think it's important for people to understand that the one person that can call us back is the governor, and we continue to entreat him to call us back uh, because constitutionally, if I could call the Senate back, I would call them back tomorrow, and I would pass the lights on bill at, at the very minimum. I actually would pass, I would pass another nine budget bills, and I would ask and push the governor to uh, sign those, but uh, but I can't. And so uh, I think it's important for people to understand that. Um, I would also, you know, I, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate their frustration. I share their frustration, uh, and we're going to continue to work on it. And, and uh, that is the spirit in which the compromises that we've offered have been offered. And more compromises down the road? Do you well, anticipate? I, I, I know that whatever the solution is will absolutely be a compromise. I understand that, and uh, and my and my members understand that. Okay, Madam Leader, thank you so much for joining thank us today. You, Senator Tom Bach has been at the governor's side since the negotiations began. Producer John Bruin sat down with the minority leader and files this report. Senator Bach, thanks for your time today. Thank you. You've experienced two government shutdowns in the last six years. What's it like for legislators in these kinds of times, knowing that government services are stopping and employees are being laid off? Well, this shutdown is much more severe than the one of 2005. In, in 2005, the majority of the budget had actually passed the legislature. Uh, I was the author that year of the environment bill, so on the 30th of June, uh, we actually passed that bill, so all the state parks remained open. Uh, all the DNR functions, like being able to purchase a lice, uh, fishing license or uh, a boat registration, all those kind of things all function, things that the public directly sees. Uh, uh, the state government finance bill had passed, so all of the state employees basically were working. There were not a lot of, uh, a large number of layoffs. I think out of 36,000, about eight or 9,000 were laid off in 2005. This time out of the 36,000 state employees, about 22,000 are laid off. So uh, this one is much broader, uh, affects a lot of uh, services that weren't impacted in 2005. So I think the public is starting now, I think, just to feel the frustration. The, the initial impact was, of course, as people uh, moved around the state on the holiday weekend, the wayside rests were closed, the state parks uh, were closed. Uh, that was kind of the first thing. Now I think uh, that the holiday weekend is over and all kind of the excitement and anticipation of that and people are getting back into their regular lives, they're going to start to see the day-to-day -day impacts of, of things that they won't be able uh, to access. So what are you hearing from constituents at, at this point? 
Well, I, over the weekend, I networked with probably a couple hundred people uh, uh, back in my district at different functions. And I think to a, port, to a person, they were pretty supportive. Now, Northeastern Minnesota is probably not representative of, of much of the state. Uh, uh, I've always kind of characterized the Arrowhead region of the state as a region of the state where people still believe in government and they still believe that uh, government has a role in uh, solving problems in communities. And it, it, that's probably where most of the state or most of the country was uh, 30, 40 years ago. And, and in the Arrowhead, it still is kind of that way. People, people still believe government has a role. So I think people have been generally supportive uh, that the things that government pays for contribute to our quality of life here in Minnesota. and and preserving things like personal care attendance for people that are you know, trying to live at home and not be in a nursing home, uh, that uh, providing an opportunity for the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic to do stem cell research to find cures for diseases uh, are important, and those are really government functions. So I, I, I would argue that uh, people were generally supportive of, you know, uh, dig in there and protect things that, that contribute to Minnesota's quality of life. In the negotiations that have led up to this point, are there any positive signs that an agreement can be reached quickly? Well, I think that will depend on, on, on the Republican leadership in the legislature's willingness to compromise. Uh, the, the, the last day of the, of the, before the shutdown, uh, they seemed willing to do and actually proposed uh, some new revenue in the form of borrowing, uh, borrowing from our K-12 schools and then borrowing from future uh, revenue streams in the form of selling a bond and and capturing future revenue for the next 20 years to pay for it. Uh, there was a willingness the, the, the last night of the session to be able to do that, uh, to get some new revenue to mitigate some of the impacts of the cuts. But I did notice uh, their position seems to have hardened now. Uh, today's paper, they indicated that any kind of uh, borrowing or shifting to schools was off the table. So it almost seems like uh, they've drifted into a harder position. They're gonna have to be willing to come back and I met with the governor uh, this morning and we talked about, uh, I, I think people have to be willing to compromise. The governor's indicated to me that he's gonna offer uh, several different uh, proposals to the Republicans on how we can close this $1.4 billion uh, gap that we have with them. And I, I think his willingness to offer different options, I think to the Republicans to consider, I think is helpful. I'm, I'm hoping that they either can take one of them or uh, counter back with, uh, uh, a proposal back to him. I think that's going to be the challenge right now is keeping everybody at the table, uh, making proposals and counter proposals back and forth and seeing if we can find some kind of a hybrid proposal of something that the Republicans want, uh, something that the governor wants, where uh, both sides maybe walk away from uh, the deal grumbling under their breath, but they, right. they, uh, they aren't angry. Senator, one of the points of contention in this negotiation is the governor's desire to pass the elements of this budget in one package and the Republicans desire to pass individual elements of the budget those that are agreed upon or can be agreed upon uh, get those out of the way and work on the more difficult things later help people understand why that is significant to this negotiating process well I, I think the public was misled some uh, in the days leading up to the shutdown uh, uh, the Republicans continually said that we're so close on on several of these uh, smaller budget bills. Let's have a special session, let's pass them. But the truth is, even on the bills that we were relatively close on the money on, there were uh, stark differences in policy. I mean, things like the higher education bill, the bill that funds the University of Minnesota and the Minsku campuses, we were very close to an agreement on how much money we're gonna spend, how much we're gonna cut, uh, and there were significant uh, uh, cuts in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, but there were policy differences. Uh, the Republicans uh, in the final day were still hanging on to, in the uh, state, in the higher ed bill, uh, provision that they wanted to make it a crime to do for the Mayo Clinic or the U of M to do stem cell research. So even in the bills that we were relatively close on money, uh, there were uh, policy differences that the governor was just never going to agree to. So do you think, uh, not with uh, lacking those policy differences of however they might get resolved. Is there, is there a chance that that might be an opening in any kind of negotiation to, you know, to go back to solving some of those individually? Or? Well, I think what would be helpful is if, if, if today or tomorrow we could get to a point where, uh, where sessions always get to. And I, 
I, I was part of the negotiations with Governor Plenty when we had a Democratic legislature for several years. And the way sessions really kind of close up is the governor ultimately says, you know, I'm not willing to do that. And, and policy provisions fall on the floor and, and you have to uh, put them off until next year. And that's where this needs to get. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, that the Republicans are willing to abandon uh, a number of policy initiatives they have. I think that's very important if we're going to find an agreement that uh, policy now uh, goes on the shelf until the next legislative session and we deal with just the budget numbers. I think that's kind of the first agreement we're going to have to reach here this week. Finally, Senator, earlier this week, uh, former Vice President Mondale, former Governor Carlson, uh, formed a, a, a group to present a third alternative sort of a budget uh, solution. What are your thoughts on that? Is that? Will that be helpful? Will it be indifferent? What, what do you think about that? Well, I don't think it hurts anything. Uh, certainly putting more heads together, more ideas, uh, could be that they will come up with something that uh, nobody has thought about. Uh, but I think for their recommendations to be taken seriously, both sides need to buy in uh, that their process could be constructive. Uh, the governor's publicly said he uh, encourages their participation and. Uh, the process, unfortunately, the Republican leaders have said that uh, it's not their job to meddle in uh, uh, in the state budget. Uh, I thought it was kind of interesting because they don't want the likes of Arne Carlson or, or uh, Mondale uh, coming up with proposals, but uh, they seem to uh, reinforce Governor Plenty when he was in town last Thursday and had a press conference at the airport and uh, suggested that Republicans need to hold their ground. Uh, I think... Uh, it can be helpful, but both sides would be willing to consider uh, what the outcome of it is. Senator, thanks again for joining us on Capitol Report. Thank you. Two former government leaders, one unique idea. Former Governor Arne Carlson and Vice President Walter Mondale have appointed a group of business leaders and former legislators to craft a third budget plan. They say the idea is to give the governor, lawmakers, and the public another option to consider. Today we're being challenged because we must make government work effectively and efficiently and to care if we're going to be the kind of Minnesota that educates her children, builds a future for our state, and an environment where we can rejoice in the joy of being Minnesotans. I'm afraid that if we don't reassert America, Minnesota's ability to think and create in this crisis, that we will be overwhelmed by national pressures to take part in this national harsh ideological debate that we see in the nation's capital and all over the country. I do anticipate that this committee, uh, with their insights, uh, will understand that their goal is to maximize flexibility and maximize options and possibly come up with a plan that will be slightly distasteful to both sides. If it's sufficiently distasteful, uh, we know uh, that we have succeeded. Uh, but I think it is essential that we have a third option. Assistant Senate Majority Leader Dave Thompson says he is skeptical the plan is one his caucus will embrace wholeheartedly. It wouldn't surprise me at all if you're going to find out from this commission that uh, what we need to do is raise revenue either in the form of taxes or, or another way. And I would simply point out that if new taxes such as increasing the sales tax quote temporarily as Governor Carlson did, of course, uh, that temporarily never did go away, uh, and higher income taxes. If those things were the solution, then we would have had a solution by now based upon uh, how it was governed during that time. The fact of the matter is that continued rising cost curve in government is exactly why we are where we are today. And I would love, as a state legislator, to have the luxury of being able to uh, you know, cut deals and compromise and grow our government and not have real uh, ramifications for real people. Unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. Because as you look to Greece, as you look to Washington, D.C., as you look to Massachusetts and, and Illinois and California, and hopefully not Minnesota, what you're seeing is that the way things have always been done has set a, a budget trajectory that cannot be sustained. 
government is largely closed for business in Minnesota and the People's House stands virtually empty as well. The Minnesota Historical Society has a full slate of tours and events scheduled for the Capitol and other state-run facilities. Brian Pease explains what this all means for them and for the public. Brian, with the Capitol closed, obviously people cannot get in here for tours right now. So what does that mean for you and for your office? Well, right now we are closed down. So with the building inaccessible, that obviously means the public isn't able to get into the front doors to see the beautiful state capitol. So basically we're able to uh, staff um, just a few hours a week just to do a, a walkthrough to see uh, that all the artifacts and the parts of the building that are historic are, are left in good condition and not any damage or vandalism occurring with those uh, important artifacts. And some of what you do is behind the scenes, of course, like the restoring of the gubernatorial portraits. Is work like that ongoing or has that all halted as well? Yeah, all of the work, uh, we've been putting a museum glass on front of all of the governor's portraits. All of that has stopped because all the funding for that basically is not available. So everything uh, that we normally would do, we're basically here just to oversee and watch you know what happens inside and outside the building. All right you talked about some of what you normally do a lot of that also entails different programs it is you know the sesquicentennial of the state and there are a lot of different events planned around the Civil War some of them at the Capitol some of those at Fort Snelling what's going to happen to different events that are through the Historic Society? Well we had a Civil War tour here scheduled for July 2nd so that was canceled and we have a history camp that's coming up for young kids to talk about the Civil War in the state capitol and that will, unless things change in the next few days, will be, will be canceled. So pretty much everything that the Minnesota Historical Society offers is not available. So what do people need to know? What, as this moves forward and everything is so fluid, what's your timeline through the Historical Society for getting information out to people? Where can they find that information? Is it on your website? Yeah, that, that's on the mnhs.org has information about um, you know, the closure of the historic sites and other things. But there's also uh, the web page is active so people can still do online research. But there's no you know, processing of any orders or anything like that. So um, it's one of those things we're just as, you know, as involved in other, as other agencies in, in the government shutdown. So our services pretty much are, are limited to what we can provide. And let's say, for example, the shutdown ends at the end of this week and perhaps there's an activity planned for next weekend. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I'm just giving a hypothetical. How quickly will that information be released to the public that something will continue as scheduled? Yeah, I believe the intention is to um, get things going as soon as possible. Um, it's just a matter of our staff being notified that we can come back to the Capitol, for instance, and, and have that program ready to be presented to the public. Any idea of a time frame, a turnaround time frame for you and your office? I, I guess the way I look at it, it's as soon as we find out, you know, we're going to be doing business as usual the next day if, if there's enough, you know, notification and, and uh, information available to get staff here. Okay, Brian, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. That's going to wrap up this week's program. And of course, you can follow the latest on the budget negotiations online at senate.mn media. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Bartke. Thank you for watching.